All right, um, so call the meeting to order at 6.30. First item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, correspondence, visitors, and public comments. Is there any uh, anyone here who'd like to make a public comment tonight? Seeing none. All right. Agenda review. Um, I know we have one item that was tabled at our last meeting, um, which are the check warrants for the month of October. Um, we wanted to make sure the administrative report questions comes after the student's presentation so that the students can go first. All right, so we will move the administrative report questions uh, to follow um, with Jen here. So we'll just slide that after the student presentation and we'll do the check warrants after the uh, budget draft item before our future agenda items. All right, any other amendments? All right, seeing none, we are now on to our presentations. So, Mrs. Digby, hand it over to you and Ms. Joyce. Actually, you're handing it over to me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, first, I just want to welcome everybody here to Franklin tonight. And we're so excited to have some of our students here tonight. They'll introduce themselves in just a second. And Mrs. Digby and Heather Digby is our she wears several different hats here. She's our Title I math teacher. She's our math um, leader. She's our interventionist. She's doing direct services to kids all day. And really um, appreciated her volunteering to be here tonight when we also have parent conferences this week and everybody's uh, hurrying around getting ready for that. And we also are going to have two other students here with us tonight. Um, Sawyer and Grace Villadu are going to be here tonight, and they were so excited about being here, and uh, we're both sick today. And I have to tell you, you guys are lucking out because Grace, who's in fourth grade, um, really was the one who was like, let's give the board a problem and make it really hard. <laughs> so you're kind of getting off easy probably tonight. So anyway, I really appreciate these guys being here, and they're going to introduce themselves, and we'll start right over here. Hi, I'm Gabriel Gage, I'm in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Emma Randall, and I'm also in sixth grade. Hi, I'm Ellen Gilman, and I'm in fourth grade. And I'm Heather Digby, um, as Joyce mentioned. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about Math Menu, um, which is something that we're doing here in Franklin. Math Menu is a structure that allows students to work independently and collaboratively. They have choice in some of the things they're working on. And one of the key things that we really like about it is it provides the teacher opportunities to differentiate their instruction. Um, every single elementary school is using Math Menu, so this is not something that just Franklin is doing. Um, our teachers, the bulk of our teachers, were trained in Math Menu with Christian Cordomanch um, during the summer of 2020. So we did it virtually. Um, so the first couple of years after COVID, we weren't able to use um, a lot of the strategies, the group work, the collaborative work, as much as we would like. So it's only in the last couple of years that we've really been able to use all the aspects of Math Menu. So the other schools were changed earlier than us, um, so it's newer to Franklin, which is why we're sharing about it. But it is something that all the schools are doing. So what we know about math education, kids experience math at different paces, and they have different needs. There needs to be variety in the types of learning that they experience. There needs to be a time for computational fluency, the facts, the addition and multiplication facts, time for games, and problem solving opportunities. All students need specialized instruction with a teacher. So similar to reading groups, Every single student gets an opportunity to work with a teacher on the type of math that they need to work on. So it could be something that they need extra practice on, or it could be enrichment. So every student gets opportunities with a teacher. And students get an opportunity to work in small groups. And it is important for students to develop responsibility in math where they have the opportunity for independence and choice. 
<clears throat> so the cre three critical must-haves, this came from the class that we took with Christian. Um, in math menu, there need to be purposeful offerings, there needs to be choice and independence, and there needs to be a teacher station. That's the guided math with direct instruction with the teacher. Here in Franklin, the time that we do math menu varies at each grade level. It could be 20 to 25 minutes a couple of times a week, or it could be 10 to 15 minutes four to five times a week. So it really depends um, on the grade level. So it's not an entire math class. The structure of menu is similar to a restaurant where you have choices. So there are some tasks that are must-dos. The students have to do those tasks. And then there are other tasks where the students have opportunities to choose what they'd like to do. They can work alone or in groups. Um, there are chances for a spiral review, which is going back and reviewing some of the material that you've done earlier in the year to see if they've still got it. Um, there's problem solving, technology, and fact fluency. So here is an example of what a menu might look like. So it would be like a cover sheet. And the haves twos or the must twos are at the top. So this teacher has everything that they need to do. There's a window pane, a journal, flashcards, and teacher time. And I'll, we'll go through all of these. And then students circle which day of the week that they did those. And then down below are the choice things. There's the brain buster. There's a couple brain busters. There's different games they can choose. And there's tech time. So every student gets one of these and knows what they have to accomplish and then what their choices are <clears throat> down below once they've got their stuff, um, their must-dos done. Emma is going to talk about window pane, which, whoops, is a must-do. In window panes, we work on current problems that we might need practice on. We also work on previous, previous learning targets that we might need to refresh and renew our minds on. There are word problems, number sentences, and other math equations that are depending on the grade level. Window pane is a must-do and has to be completed alone so that what goes on the paper is our work, not our friends. So we've got a couple of examples. So it's called window pane and it looks like a window pane. So there might be four or five or six different sections. So this one has some rounding, <coughs> subtracting with regrouping, putting numbers in order, a word problem, and then telling time, which is something from a previous grade for teachers to kind of check to see um, who's got that. Another example. This one is from a first grade. So there are fewer window panes, but there's two pages. So there's some stuff on tens and ones, numbers before and after, greater than, less than, counting on, number bonds, and then solving an equation where the unknown is in lots of positions. So the window pane is the more skill work um, with some problem solving. And a third example, this one has some skip counting, um, a couple of word problems. Of course, this word problem has myself about cinnamon buns. That's what most of my word problems are about. And then here's a different unknown in lots of positions, only this is with multiplication. So those are some examples of what window pane would look like. Journal. Gabe is going to talk about journal. Well, the journal is a must do and it allows students to write about their thinking. So when, um, a journal kind of makes you use your brain to think about a good explanation for the question that it's giving you. You can work alone on the journal, or you can work with a partner. So, like true or false, you just have to write an explanation on why a sentence like that is true or it is false. And there's the, this one, sometimes always or never. So like when you add one to an odd number, you would, you would get an even number. I'd write an explanation on why it would sometimes be true, always be true, or never be true. Teacher station. This is what, as teachers, we love the most. This is the key to menu. So this is where students have a time with a teacher, and they get to work on math at their just right level. 
Um, teachers use window panes and formative assessments to help determine what the math is that each student needs to work on. So here's an example of a teacher station. This looks kind of busy, I'm gonna give you the gist. So in this class, they have menu on Wednesday, Thursday, and Wednesday, Thursday. So this is a two week menu. This left side has the different adults that are available and which days, if they're blocked out, the adult is not in the room. But it says, so for this, these two weeks, the teacher's, teacher might be doing um, an assessment on their multiplication facts. Someone else is working with, these are all made up names. We don't have any of these students with these names in the school. So um, might be doing some ratios. This, the para might be circulating around the room. These kids will be working on ratios. These two need surface area practice. These need area of triangle practice. So the teacher can really look at what kids need and set up a time for them to work with a teacher on what they need. And then this is another one that's Wednesday, Thursday, and this is more areas of triangles, um, area of a rectangle with one of the sides as a decimal. Um, some groups get some inter um, enrichment. So these three groups down here got some intervention, um, <coughs> enrichment, excuse me. So the teachers can really tailor it to what the students need after looking at data. This is what we've really been able to get up and running the last two years, that we've been able to have kids back in groups. Tech time, we also have as one of the choices, um, tech time, these are just four of the websites that teachers use. Um, there are lots of different ones, but the kids go on and there might be a specific assignment that's on there, or they might have specific um, tasks that they need to complete um, with their, on that website. Games, this is also a choice. Um, students can work on specific targeted facts for fact fluency and many of the games that we have um, kind of go through every grade level but the level of difficulty in the operation increases or changes as you go through each grade level. So Orin is going to talk about the first game, Bump. So the way you play Bump is you um, have a die and you're going to have a number you multiply it by and so say you rolled a two, you'd multiply that number by two, and you'd get four, and um, you'd put a trip on four, and say then your friend got the same thing, he'd bump you off, and then if he got that again before you did, he could put a chip and it's locked, and at the end of the game when all of them, the um, spaces are locked, you count up how many you have and how many your friend has, and whoever has the most wins. For the younger grades, you might have something like add one or subtract one or add 10 or subtract 10. So that's how this game can be tailored for different grade levels. And then Orin's going to also talk about pigs in a pen. So the way you play pigs in a pen, you have a target number and um, that number you're going to multiply or add or subtract by. And um, so say you got rolled a five, you can multiply that number by 10 and you got um, uh, 50, so you'd, you'd put a, a line through it, um, you'd put a line on the side, and um, once you got um, three lines on all the sides, whoever's the last one to um, put a line on and cover it up, you then color it in, and when they're all um, colored in, you can count them all up, and whoever has the most wins. Flex thinking, problem solvers, brain busters. This is also a choice, and Gabe's going to talk about this. Um, problem sol flex thinking is problem solving means engaging in a task for which the solution method is not known in advance. So flex thinking is a choice, and you can do it with friends, and it makes your brain work harder like than some years before. It makes you do stuff from years before, current units, and even some stuff that you haven't learned yet. <clears throat> and you can do the math with partners. So one example is from first grade. On this one you would just, like, it gives, like, you a question, like, teacher gives you 21 buttons, 
and then it gives you two or three bonds, and that asks you how many, so many you can build. So we would be teachers would be looking to see if students could follow that they're only building snowmen with two or three buttons, and did they use all 21? So this one, it just asks, tells you that there's eight heads, and then 22 sheep, I mean head, feet, and then so you would just look at the picture and see that there are four feet on the sheep and two feet on the hens, and then the question is how many feet are, how, how many hens were there? And then you would solve how many hens were there. This is the question students are gonna hand out to you guys to solve. We're gonna give you a couple minutes to work on this one and use whatever strategy. <laughs> it's always a choice to win. <laughs> Even though Gracie couldn't be here, we had to give you a problem. <laughs> we won't make it homework though. The kids want to make it homework. I'd rather do it as homework. <laughs> no pressure. So <laughs> eight heads and twenty-two feet. How many hens? Do you want one? We'll only give you a couple of minutes and then we'll go through what some strategies. And you don't have to share. You don't have to share. But <laughs> you want to. And you can write right on the paper. Julie, I see you writing. Nice job. And you can work with a partner if you would like. I'd choose one of the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is when Grace probably really wishes she was here. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't use algebra. I used uh, I had Mr. Henderson at MB. Anybody remember him? Oh, mm -hmm. Henderson. Yes. Uh, and uh, he would call what I did. I, uh, it's fitting because we're talking about sheep and chicken. <laughs> I did the chicken yard method. Oh. That's what he would call it. If if you didn't use algebra, but you used that kind of a half guess and check. <laughs> yeah, guess and check. Guess and check. The chicken yard. That is actually a strategy. That's that's mm -hmm. what I did. What did it do? The chicken what? The chicken yard method. Oh, chicken you just got it. <laughs> and scratch. Yeah. Heather actually worked. Oh, you actually did a math problem. <laughs> I did not do a math problem. Yeah, there, I'm sure there's some algebra in this. You method. can do it algebraically, but yeah. you don't have to. Yeah. 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 This is actually a second grade task. Wow. Uh huh. How quickly do they get it done? <laughs> That's, I talk with the teacher and they use a lot of manipulatives and, and I'll go through what some strategies a second grader can do. But you can also do this algebraically. So it's something where we could change the numbers and give it to older grades and see if they can solve it with parentheses and algebra and stuff like that at the upper level. Do you guys want to go through what the answer is, or do you want me to go through the example? He's dying to do it. Before you do that, could you read the? Could you all read the question? So for those of us at home that don't know it, thank you. It says, on a farm, there were some hens and sheep. All together, there were eight heads and twenty-two feet. How many hens were there? Okay. Or someone could get Thank you. Philosophical That's great. and say it's a trick question because sheep don't have feet. <laughs> you would actually. <laughs> there might be a second grader who would say that. <laughs> Neither do. Well, I guess chickens have feet. Sheep don't. It's always a tough one. All right. Do you want to share your answers? You want me to show you an example? I don't want to cut anyone off if you want to share what you did or what you got. <laughs> For an answer, I think Gabe was waiting to share it too. Mm -hmm. You don't want to share it now? Oh, come on, Gabe. You did earlier. All right. <laughs> 
You didn't solve it like the second grader, though. No. And that's okay. You use multiplication yeah. to solve it's it. Fine. Yeah, All right. I'll go through a sample solution of the second grader. <clears throat> so they may start by drawing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heads, and then start putting legs. So two legs, then four legs, and four, and then count, start counting. And if they did it this way, they would get 28 legs. So they might cross out a couple of sheep and make those two hens, and then count again, and that gets you to 24. So they might cross out this extra sheep and have three hens down here, and then go from there. So they would do kind of guessing and checking or have models or something out. Um, and when they're doing these flex thinking and problem solving, this is not for students to do a final draft, like a um, specific neat and organized layout. These are for them to just show their thinking and just do some math thinking, um, et cetera. It doesn't have to be a neat, polished piece um, like some of the stuff that we do. So it is five hens and three sheep. Is that what you got, Toby? Thank you for reading that out loud. It was fun to do. <laughs> yes. I have that answer. Excellent. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have questions um, that the students are going to answer, and then if there's anything you would like to ask us, uh, we're open to that. So first one up for each of you, and we'll start with Gabe. What do you like about Math Menu? Well, I like the games, and I like being able to do it with the partners, and I like having the break from like the current unit you are doing. There are some questions about the unit that you're doing, but it's like, good to get a break from your normal mm -hmm. unit. Emma? In math menu, I like that we get extra practice and we can refresh our brains on work that we might not remember. And Warren. I also like the games because you can play with a partner and it's a fun way to learn math. And then what are th some things that you would like changed or added? And we'll start with Oren. Um, I want there to be more options with tech because you only have one um, option of what you want to do. Emma? One thing that I would like to see change is more choice in games. So there might be different levels and choices for each level. So that you're practicing at your just right level or a level that might be challenging. Thank I would you. like to see more games, um, more tech options, and harder like problems on games. Okay. Like maybe some like X moments. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for us? So do they still have substitute teach in the primary grade? <laughs> no. Actually, last year, Heather, you just want to quickly mention what you did last year with the younger grades. So we had, with the sixth grade, um, we had them buddy up. Um, some of them missed 10 minutes of their snack time and then had snack later. Um, buddy up with a kindergartner or a first grader to just do read from their book box or just do some counting and... Um, some quick skill practice like that. We buddied them up last That's year. That's a one. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids, even some of the older kids, even missed recess to do that. Yep. Which yeah. was really not worthy, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to give these guys a hand if we can do that right now. Is, is math the favorite subject? Hmm? All three is math. Mathematics, their favorite subject. I don't know. Ask them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you don't have to say yes. Just no. <laughs> Tell me what your favorite subject is. Probably science. No. No. Mm, I don't really know. Okay. None of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of you ever let a week go by without choosing the tech option? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you skip it sometimes. Well, sometimes I just don't have the time, like with oh. the teacher station, so. Sometimes I just take too long on other things. Gotcha. So there's the, the mandatory section, and then they they have the tech and games and all that. Is is I'm sure it's monitored, but do do, do the teacher do, she, do you see what they did on the games and that? So you that is being 
looked at as well. It's not yes. Just, okay. So at the end of a menu cycle, so they might have two weeks of, of this current menu, um, students will staple all their work together. So if there's something like pigs in a pen where you can see what they colored in and whatever, you can see all of that. You can get teachers get their flex thinking, their problem solving. Um, and that way they can look, and if they see most kids um, did one problem solver but didn't get to the second one, then they'll add that, keep that second one on for another month or another rotation um, so students get a chance to do that one. So you can see if a student's going down the wrong road, you can mm -hmm. help correct it. Mm -hmm. And there might be some um, problem solving ones that they'll talk about as a whole class. You know, after menu is done, they'll say, a lot of you tried this one, um, let's talk about some of your strategies. So it doesn't have to be with everyone, but every now and then they can go over that. Okay. All right. Well, Gabe and Emma and Oren, thank you guys for coming tonight, sharing uh, the math problems, and I think you almost had a few of us stumped on this problem. <laughs> well done. Yeah, so thank you. And yeah. Parents, thanks for coming, parents and family members. Thanks for bringing me I wasn't in school here then. But she was Thanks, Joyce, for organizing that. That was great. I did want to tell you the kids are on the cards. Those were their notes. They decided to write those notes down. Those weren't anything that we gave them to say. All right. Um, next item. Uh, this is where we put in our administrative report questions. Um, I think Jen Sorger is online. If anyone has any questions on the proficiency-based grading update, and Don, I know you had one about Highgate, so I'll turn it over to you if you'd like. Sure. Um, and maybe I missed a meeting of facility. I know I missed, but I was really surprised when I read the Highgate report found that they are building something, outdoor classroom. Yes, that was in the, um, that's in the ARP ESSER plan. Right. Yeah. Well, I would have thought that might come before the facilities committee. It's a, a facility. Say, Peter or Toby, you guys, I missed the meeting. Did you know about that? I, yeah, I mean, I, I looked at that today as well, and I, I was like, I had never seen or heard of that. And like, to Don's point, I didn't know if I had missed it somewhere, but I thought that it's not that for approval or anything like that, but I think right. those things, no, if, they don't, if they don't, if they don't come to at least the, the facilities board, it makes it hard for us when it comes budget time and it comes time to approve stuff that people think you don't even know <laughs> what's in the, you know, what you guys are doing there. So just, just well, help keep us on the agenda for the next one. Okay. Because it's following, so we put it in the stakeholder engagement plan several times that you've seen, um, but it has not, it's not ready to happen yet. We submitted for concept approval with the AOE, and once we had that, then we were bringing it with the full plans. There's not a full design yet. We didn't know what the exact cost was going to be. Or I saw a so picture, and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. That's what I saw. I was going to give our stuff for the addition. I was going to say, Joyce actually had one in there, that, was too, the that picture. we were thinking about, yeah. 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 And I'm going back to what I said in follow with Peter. It's not that I think facilities have to prove it. We want to why we're a committee, but it would, you know, somebody might have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought of using cedar rather than something else? So I think it's, first of all, I think it's a courtesy, but secondly, I guess when I read that, it looked like it was in existence away in the article. I know, it looked like it was up in the backyard uh, up in, already. Yeah, and running, thank you, yeah. Yeah, so it is on the next one, and we should probably make sure that we don't have it in a board report before it goes to the committee, uh, and, and people would see that. Anyway, I think that's a great idea, but I, 
thought the process might have been a little weak. All right, anything else, Don? That was it. That was it, all right, any other questions for any of the admin team? I said before, I thought Dan, and probably Joanne too, at that meeting, but that sounded like you got a lot done from Ag meeting. Um, we did have Jan Sorger join us, so um, I noticed in, in the report on proficiency-based grading that you're working to schedule the parent forums. How's that scheduling process going? Sure, I reached out to them last week um, and they were going to put some feelers out about good dates. We were looking at perhaps the full week before Thanksgiving um, as possible, possible week for folks, enough time for individuals to make plans, not too soon, but also um, not too far away. I haven't yet heard back from them about um, specifics. Um, is there anything else the board can do to help support this work that you're doing? Um, I think not really, not that I can think of right now. We had a little bit of a bump with uh, some logistics and technical issues in PowerSchool, but we were in the tech server, excuse me, the test server last week, and we were able to work those through. We're going to work with our teachers on Friday during in-service to push the final um, updates through in PowerSchool, and we should be ready in time for report cards. And once those changes are pushed through, we'll work on the communication piece um, for families and students. All right. Anything else for Jen? Thanks, Jen. I had a question on Julie's report. Yep. Um, Julie, the, uh, you, you talked about the tech and the mm -hmm. regional advisory board yep. for the tech. So uh, I guess, uh, what's the composition of that? Board. There are some, it's, it's an advisory board, sort of like the Ag Advisory Board, but for the, the region. Um, we have uh, at least one board member on it. Um, we have the directors of the two tech centers and all the superintendents. Um, it's not, it, it disappeared for a while. We're trying to bring it back. Um, and later we're going to actually, we're trying to do something to really bring technical education to the forefront. And so we have some things we're trying to plan for the spring together. So that's really one of the purposes of our, of our meeting together. I don't want to rehash our, whatever. Resolution? Be a resolution. Yes. But, but the resolution talked about governance mm -hmm. of the regional board, mm -hmm. right? And what, what was, uh, I should know this, but refresh me if someone can real quickly. I don't want to go off mm -hmm. way quick, but what was that resolution? What were, what, were, what were we aiming for there with the governance piece? Well, we're trying to get uh, some legislation, hopefully, uh, get somebody to introduce a bill. I think there is a study committee that mm -hmm. the governor tied to some economic development money. Uh, it was real interesting at our meeting uh, when I reported that out as our resolution. And, and we also merged it with Mount Mansfield. Mount Mansfield District's been hot on this for years because uh, Essex kind of decides what's going to be done and you do it or you don't play. Right, that's, that's, and, that's what and I And so see. Vicki uh, Granning, yeah, no, it's not, it's Edie. Edie mm -hmm. Granning, she spoke because uh, there was a tech center director there who's a school board member in another district. And he wanted to amend our motion in saying that... Uh, Money is the issue, but governance is fine. And uh, we let him talk, and I know he didn't know, but I knew probably more about the Springfield agreement from right. Howard Dean with the prison than he knew. I think he's an excellent director, but he didn't know some of the politics. So I kind of refreshed his memory on how we got there, and that just because Springfield has all kinds of money and a wonderful uh, facility, and they can engage other people in conversations. Uh, not everybody's that fortunate. Right. And so the motion passed as uh, as stated, and I talked to him briefly afterwards, and I think he felt all right. <laughs> I, think he, I think he felt he needed to make a statement for mm -hmm. the community. Uh, but governance is an issue because uh, the committee that 
You're talking about advisory. It's advisory. advisory. It's not a governing board. Right. 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 So when but push comes to shove, the people who are sitting around the table in Maple Run mm -hmm. say this is the way it's going to be. Now, I'm not saying they do that, but in some places, because I've been on those boards, uh, I chaired one and for Burlington and Essex. At the end of the day, your know, advisory is nice, but this is the way we're going to do it. Right. Julie, I wanted to ask you, the school board members in, in the districts where I worked, each district that sent students had, could send a school board member and a superintendent. Yes. So do we send an MD? We haven't yet. And, mm -hmm. and it's just getting off the ground. Okay, good. Um, we're just bringing it back because we really feel like we, we want to act as if we don't have separate governing boards. And we really want to, Franklin West, for example, has the permission now, if it's in a student's PLP, they can send a student to Northwest North Tech instead of Essex or Burlington. So, you know, we really want to try and act more flexibly within the rules, but we want to promote a better system and everybody at the table really wants better governance and, and really one system for the county because that would make more sense. I think because there are fewer students in Vermont schools that career centers are suffering <laughs> with numbers like everybody else. Sometimes that promotes congeniality. That's good. Yeah. Any other questions? I yeah, have just sports. one thing. Um, concerning the proficiency grading, sure. um, is the last update that's in the drive the most recent one, or is there another one with more changes coming beyond the media? The one that's linked should be correct. I, I, I hope I didn't make a mistake, Manning. So the, the one that's most recent, recent should speak about how they were able to fix the power school grading system. Okay, so there is another recent one that shows how that's fixed. Yes, that did. So if, uh, let, me, let me make sure you have the correct one. It, the correct one should be linked in the agenda. If not, I believe it's definitely in the folder for today. The the, the the 11 one folder, correct? That's the one I was using today. Yeah, let me double check it. It's, it's I like, think I didn't link it until it was updated. It's like a three, there's like three sections, each question, what yeah. they did and what's left to do. Yeah, the one in the drive is correct. It, yeah. they, they made, they adjusted the server. They used the test server to run new calculations. It's not as easy as yeah, so it says that they um, we have found revision more challenging than anticipated, but have clearly that's the yes, that's the correct one. one. So there are a few items on here that are still in process. So we'll um, I'll work with Julie to figure out a reasonable time frame, but we'll get another update on this um, as the work progresses. Okay. At some point in the future. Um, all right. Any other admin report questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to our continuous improvement plan report from Kosha. So I'm going to share it, hypothetically. And there are more slides in there than we're going to go over. I have some good background information for you as well. Kosha is going to focus on the academic achievement aspect. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here to report on uh, how my students are doing this fall compared to last fall, as the board wanted to know. And um, my objectives for today are really to review the baseline data. The national and state trends are put in there so that you have a context, but I'm not going to go over that since you already have access to the presentation and you can look at it. Uh, on your own time, and then we're going to review some of the district's action steps in response to that data. So just to, for a quick reminder, and also for community members who might be listening in, uh, we use a universal screener at the beginning of the year to really identify how kids are doing in reading and math. These uh, universal screeners are administered from grades kindergarten all the way through ninth grade. And then based on that information, 
uh, each school makes decisions about which students are on track to meet end of year grade level proficiency and then which students may need some supplemental support in order to get there. So the screener we are using currently is Star 360 and uh, we started using that district-wide last year. So now we have two years of data. And this is a kind of screening report that teachers get. And in the red, it shows you students who are uh, you know, below proficiency and who need urgent intervention. The yellow is students who do need some kind of intervention. Blue is students who are nearly there. Uh, and then the green are students who are meeting proficiency. And it's really important for teachers to get this kind of information because, you know, as Heather mentioned in her uh, little presentation, we want to make sure all students are challenged. So even the students who are already proficient, we want to see growth in those students as much as we want to see growth in our students who are um, needing some extra support. Um, and once the screening has been completed, then the interventionists, coaches, teachers sit down, look at that data, and they identify kids where they feel they need more information on that student. So they provide diagnostic tests that would help really pinpoint what might be some of the skills those students are missing, and then they would design interventions based on that information. So this is kind of like how our STAR 360 fits into our continuous improvement plan. And it's the screening, then you're setting goals. Teachers set goals for the classroom. They set goals for individual students. Some students receive intervention. And then the progress is monitored all through the year. Um, and teams of teachers are constantly looking at this data after each screening window. And then they make uh, adjustments in the kind of instruction that they provide whether it's at the classroom level, small groups, or for individual students. I just put this in for you to see current school enrollment. Our current number at MBSD is 7, 1791, which is very close to what our June numbers were. And it's a little higher than the student enrollment in June. Um, one of the things we decided to do this year is uh, we knew that our youngest students were most affected by the pandemic and the inconsistent instruction that they've received over the last two years and three months. So we decided all our first graders were going to take the start early literacy screening um, just to be able to see where they are in those early literacy foundational skills. These are the skills that students need in order to become readers and mathematicians. So it includes uh, phonological awareness, phonics, word recognition, uh, fluency, as well as uh, vocabulary and uh, early number recognition counting. So based on all our first grade data, we found that um, this year we had 21% in Franklin, 35% in Highgate, and 18% in Swanton that were proficient. And we weren't surprised because we knew there were lots of gaps in learning, but this is a baseline for us so that we know what we need to work on for those first graders all through the year. We also tried to track, just one second. Go back? Yeah, just <laughs> one second. We also uh, were curious about how many of those current first graders attended pre-K. So I got this information from Wendy just so that we could say, see what was there a correlation between preschool attendance and their current uh, academic performance. So in Franklin, we had 79% uh, of students had attended preschool year. In Highgate, it was 56%, and Swanton was 45%. So although that did have an impact, we know that they had a very um, sort of inconsistent kindergarten year, and we know that also impacted how they performed in the first grade. So, like Franklin's 15 and 9, so 15 out of, went, 19. Out of 19 went preschool. The other four doesn't mean they didn't go to preschool, right? 
Uh, these are the ones who went to preschool in our school. But they still could, the other four could have gone to preschool somewhere else. Correct, yeah. In the district, Whatever. right? No, no, it could have been a private preschool. Right. right. Oh, okay. But, all right. So, so okay. Uh, just to go back, that 15 in Franklin, that doesn't necessarily mean they all went to Franklin for pre K. Yes, it does. It does. Mm -hmm. So, what if they went to Swanton for pre K because their mother works at Leader? Where would they show up? <clears throat> as a non MVSD? So, they would show up in the Swanton Leader then. Right? Yes. Joyce? We haven't had we haven't really had much yeah, of that we... mobility between schools mm -hmm. recently. You know, when we were debating school choice for months, we thought we were going to get a lot of movement. But that's why I'm asking the question. So. Uh, yeah, I I don't know the answer to that, but uh, guessing that this was two years ago during the pandemic, I. I would have to check in with Wendy, but I don't think we had any of our kids going to. We had kids from here good. who lived in other towns, but I don't know that we had kids from here yeah. going, going to other towns. Yeah, like we had right. a couple that were from other towns coming here. Right. Because so, so that 15 doesn't include kids from other towns that were going here. That's it could, but they would then. We had a couple of students that came to pre-K here, and then they exercised school choice for kindergarten. Right. So they would still be here. Gotcha. Okay. Boy, I gave thirty-five percent. Mm -hmm. um, this is our reading data. So, as I mentioned, all our first graders took the early literacy assessment, and then second grade to sixth grade took uh, the reading in in our elementary schools. And then at MBU, we had grade seven through nine. And you can see from this that we saw a definite decline from a fall of 2021 in our percentage of proficiency. And um, Devin asked me to calculate for MVSD. So we are seeing an approximate 5% decrease from fall of 2021. And then this, I just wanted to show you the percentile rank distribution. And one of the things that are highlighted in, in yellow are our students who were already struggling and they were below at the 25th percentile. We are seeing an increase in that, um, which is also following national trends where students who are from our historically marginalized populations like students uh, who are on free and reduced lunch or who are students with special needs, those students who are struggling, struggled even more during the pandemic because they did not get the supports and the consistent instruction that usually helps those students to keep working hard. We also saw uh, some of our students who were proficient uh, decrease. So this is definitely just something for us to keep a watch on. And that's what current research is coming out nationally, which is showing that the students who were already in, um, at risk uh, have shown a further decline. And this is our math data. So again, you see um, you know, a decrease a decline from fall 2021. And um, overall at MVSD, uh, approximate 5% decrease. And um, you can see individually for each school how they did. But you know our goal is to keep working on our continuous improvement plan so that we can keep showing progress. This one again shows you in math also, we saw the students who were in our bottom 25th percentile, um, those numbers increase. So our students who were below proficiency are definitely struggling more. And the gaps in learning have increased for those kids. So the challenge right now is how do we allocate our current resources? How do we provide that supplemental instruction to them when so many needs have increased for students. Um, the next six slides I'm gonna skip over, you have access to them. This is just based on national trends with the NAEP, which is the National Assessment for Educational Progress. This just came out last week, 
and they are showing very similar trends of decline in math and reading scores from 2019 to 2022. So, Julie, you can skip. I'm just going to go right through them, but it's just quarterly <laughs> data. Yeah, and again, the national trends are also showing that students who uh, are on free and reduced lunch are showing the greatest declines in uh, their academic performance. Uh, this is just Renaissance also just came out with a study. They did a spring to spring um, report on how students are doing. And you can see this is just the Vermont data. So uh, school districts and supervisory unions in Vermont who are using STAR, they uh, calculated how those um, students are doing. And we saw, uh, uh, Renaissance saw a 3% decline in uh, literacy scores. They also looked at the student growth percentile for literacy because we want to make sure that students are growing. This is on a scale from zero to 99. So when you look at growth, you want to see kids getting as close to that 99. And it was about 49. So students are showing average growth, but currently with the, all the lags in uh, student learning, um, that's not going to be enough, but, and we know it's going to take two or three years for them to show enough growth to catch up to where they need to be. Next one. And this is same for math. For math in Vermont, uh, based on STAR uh, data, they did not see any decline. Uh, students held steady at 62% proficiency, and they did see a growth percentile of uh, 47 So this is our growth that we saw last year at MBSD uh, in reading proficiency. We started the year with 36% and increased to 41% by the end of the year. And in math, we started at 46% and went to 52% from fall to spring. And as I've mentioned previously in my presentation on our continuous improvement plan, our uh, our goal for this year is to increase reading proficiency in the district from that 41%, which we achieved in spring, to 50% by spring of 23. And then math proficiency, we want to increase from our spring end of year, 52% uh, to 60%. So that's the goal we've set for our district. And then each school is creating a goal for themselves uh, based on their baseline data. And they will share that with you, with the board, when they do their individual reporting on their continuous improvement plan and strategies that they are putting in place for their schools. And so we have to stay the course and just continue working on our CIP goals. We are really working on building our multi-tiered system of support, as I reported on last time. We are continuing to look at, at student data regularly to make decisions, building teacher expertise. We've had um, several groups of teachers going for specialized training in math. We have a few groups going for some secondary literacy intervention training. We also have a group of 15 people going to an RTI training. So we are continuing to support that, uh, that building of expertise to help with uh, dealing with all the this uh, current lags in uh, academic performance. We also continue to support our new teachers who need our support more than ever. Uh, we have 40 new teachers this year, and many of them are extremely young. They're 22 and 23 years old. So we have a formal mentoring program for them. And then in addition, we also have Tina Bugren from Marzano Research coming three times during the year to really help them understand the instructional framework, which we adopted seven years ago. Um, we are also doing our best to partner with families and community to help support all the needs of our students and then continuing to support wellness in our students and our adults. And finally, just wanted to review with you some of the things we've already implemented and things that we are going to implement this year. You know, we have been implementing data days for several years now where 
three times a year, each school really does a deep dive into the data and make decisions about <coughs> which students need intervention, who's going to see which kids, how long will the intervention be, all those things. We've uh, been using uh, math and reading screeners since last year. We also added online intervention programs um, in uh, Renaissance as a program called Freckle, which we provide in both math and ELA. And then the high school is using uh, Reading Plus. Uh, we also added an attendance, engagement, parent outreach coordinator, Celine, who continues to help support our students who have those issues. We've increased mental health support through art therapy. Uh, we increased that from two days a week last year to four days a week this year. And then we did our NTSS audit so that we really work on our systems of support. And what we are implementing this year, we've added a SEM universal screener. So the elementary schools are currently administering that and the MVU will be administering it in the next few weeks. And as I mentioned, specialized training for staff through coaching, job embedded PD and workshops and conferences. We have formed a district level continuous improvement team which is going to meet four times during the year to really review data and strategies. And uh, we've had our first edgy climber training, which is a cohesive data warehouse that's going to enable each school to look at students, all the data in one place. So they'd be able to see attendance, academic, and behavior SEL data. Uh, MBU is piloting a new math program this year. And then our elementary schools are piloting a new math program in some of their classrooms. So those were the, the this is just <coughs> if you are interested, um, a group of researchers from Harvard and Stanford just published this last Friday uh, in terms of what they are seeing uh, districts around the country, the kind of uh, learning loss that they have experienced. And again, they've identified that the losses were largest in higher poverty districts. And the more time students spent in remote learning, mm -hmm. the greater gaps we are seeing in academics there. So uh, I did link the uh, actual report in the slideshow if you're interested in reading mm -hmm. more. There's a lot more data over there. And their final conclusion was really that we have to work not just as a school system, but with our community, mental health agencies, to really help support all the after effects of the pandemic so that our students can thrive. So that was it from me. Um, and then I had, if you had any questions. All right, thanks, Kosha. Welcome to the board. Any questions, thanks for Kosha. I'll be with you, Bill. Yep, I'll have one. Somebody else have one first. I think so if you've got somebody. Okay, let's uh, let's go back to uh, the truancy or attendance coordinator. Yes. Right. Is it possible to go back? I don't know, maybe five or six screens where you showed uh, proficiency. There were a number of them showed proficiency, say in math, at the different grade levels. Is there any way to look at? <coughs> the pupils in that cohort and what their attendance record is in school? We will be able to now because we have EduClimber. We didn't have that prior to that. Well, we have it now. But now, yeah, and Celine has participated in the training and she's really excited that she's going to be able to track because it'll red flag uh, students who are at risk for truancy and then you can look at their academic data and you can really help support their learning. So from this year, we'd be able to do that. I would like, as we get that, because I, I strongly believe yeah. that many of those students miss 15, 20, 25 days. Yeah. And I don't care how good our teachers are, whether they're young mm -hmm. or 40 years experience, if a child doesn't show up, yeah. it's pretty hard to teach them. And it's still, yeah, and we're uh, just talking about it today, it's still yeah. a big trend. Yes. Um, I mean, you look at that data, you know, nobody was really remote last year. But people were not in school consistently, and their teachers were not in school consistently because people were ill. And it's still continuing, not as much as last year. It's improving, but it's not back to 
pre-pandemic levels. But our absenteeism for the first 30 days of school was not that far off from what it was last year at the start of school. And it's exactly what Don said. It, it's, you have to have kids in school. And it's not, and they're not truant. Most of our kids are not truant, but they've just been sick and they've been out of school. And last year it was multiple days in a row. It was five days in a row. It wasn't a day here, a day there. Um, we had over 1,800 absences in this school last year, and that's not including support staff. And, and you teachers. know, this is a small, very friendly type environment here. You run a really good school. I think you know the parents. You know, I live in Swanton. Nothing gets the Swanton school. I see kids every day walking the streets in Swanton who should be in school, and some of them are elementary. I always want to pull over. I just want to be in school. And, and I'll be like, well, mom didn't get us up early, so she said she wasn't going to bother to take us for. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, and Selena is going to do a report for the board once she has some data so that you can see. Uh, currently, um, there are still a lot of concerns about MVU and Swanton students and the absenteeism that she's seeing there. Um, and, you know, contacting families to find out what are the barriers, what's preventing. There is still a lot of social anxiety, and um, there are some students who are just refusing to come to school. And um, she gave me an example of a family where the parents have basically told the kid it's fine, don't go to school. But that's not teaching them strategies because anxiety is always going to be there. But for some students, it has become a real issue. So she is now tracking those kids and really working with the families to find out what we can do to help support the student, like starting off by come for two hours a day, then come for half a day. So she's really working with families to try and figure out how we can get them back. Yeah. Some of you probably remember, but for either earlier this year or last year, I asked Julie, and Julie, you had data. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as bad as I may think we are, we're better than a lot of schools. Yeah. Attendance is really terrible in some of the schools. We're more so. It's really sad. It's but it really is also, it, it's like, I, I hear you're talking about the truancy, but there really has been a lot of sickness. That like, like the absences here were not, I mean, people are all being responsible, and but it was, kids are sick. And that's what's happening this fall too. It's just a lot. There's just, yes. there, last year there was just so much instructional time lost um, because mm -hmm. of, because of sickness, and I'm sure some truancy, but there, but yeah. just it was a lot of sickness. Here. It all adds up, right? And that's why we really have to look at growth because for some of those kids, the amount of time lost, um, they're just not going to all of a sudden become proficient. It, you've got to look at what the growth is, and they're and if they're showing growth um, toward that proficiency. <coughs> yes, Terry has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Terry. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. I know I've got to talk about sickness. Here I am. <laughs> See, way. there's a lot of sickness. Oh, again, I can't come in, but thank you. But I had a thank you, Kosha, for this report. I think it's really helpful, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you told us about the different schools and how they're doing, because I, I think when you look overall as a district, the, the loss isn't that great, but when you look at certain schools, it is, and so I'm really glad that you're targeting uh, you know, that you, you spent some time telling us which all are doing. And I was really happy to hear that we've got some consistency going across schools now in terms of the math program, in terms of the reading, it, you know, it's wonderful. Because in the past we used to have differences in scores and there was a variety of reasons. So now having more standardized across, it's easier to try and intervene. But the other thing I wondered is, it's only, I mean, it is November, but when these scores were taken, isn't there always some loss between you know, when they take stuff at the end of a year in spring or whatever, and, and then when they take tests again in fall because of the summer months when they're out of school. So isn't there going to always be some of that loss? So shouldn't they do better just inherently because they're in school when you take tests in the spring versus the fall? And how do we account for that in this? Well, this we're comparing fall to fall. Oh, it's fall to fall. I thought it was uh, spring. Right. We, our okay. goal is to increase our out. We're going to report three times this year, and our goal is to get to an increased number at the end of the year. Right. I was looking year. at those past ones, so I'm sorry. Talk about sickness interfering with <laughs> performance. I didn't even pay attention. I'm so sorry. No, Thank but you. we are. It, I mean, it, I think it's important to look at that we're starting behind where we started last year, 
So we have, and we have an ambitious goal. So we're gonna, you know, continue to look at all our strategies and intervention, make adjustments. But uh, we'll be reporting on this data fall to fall, winter to winter, and spring to spring. So you can That's see great. how we Thank make you. it at the end. Thank you. Yeah, and Terry, you're absolutely right. I mean, you do see learning loss over the summer. We know that for sure. And so uh, we want to keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, Bethan is doing a fantastic job of running our summer program. We've intensified the tutoring that we are offering over the summer and really helping those students who we can get into our buildings to take advantage of the tutoring we offer. In addition, uh, last year, uh, Jen and the MVU team had offered vacation camps. So we definitely increased as much as possible the supports we can offer students when schools are not in session. And so we are hoping to mitigate some of that. But yeah, there's definitely learning loss. So we will definitely show you, as uh, Julie said, fall to fall, winter to winter, and spring to spring data, but we also want to make sure that we are reporting this fall to spring how much growth our students are showing uh, with greater consistency in instruction. Yeah, that's a great point because you mentioned that and we saw that happen this fall, so maybe that's why we're not as bad as we could have been. Right. With the, with the difference. So that's great. Yeah, there was a lot going on this summer, which was really great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Peter, you have a question? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's discouraging um, that we have so many failing in proficiency. Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I appreciate the conclusion because that's what I was wondering. What, what are we getting at here? And, and we're still into the COVID, um, but yet we do have school back, and we had it back last year. And and I hear Joy saying that we still have a lot of absences but if if and i know we don't have the room in the schools but are we doing our students any favors by keep pushing them along if they're not meeting the standard i mean should we if they haven't had enough time in the class whether you know understood you know if they're sick it's perfectly understandable, but if they don't have those hours that Joyce is talking about, shouldn't we be waiting until they have those and ha are proficient before they move on to the next grade or the next? That's a really good question, but the experts are saying you can't do that because then you're going to be teaching third graders what they missed in first grade, and you're going to be teaching fourth graders what they missed in second grade, and they're never going to catch up. So the recommendation of most content experts is you keep teaching the standards, but you're also, what Heather was mentioning, the spiraling, spiraling curriculum. So you're going back. That's what our interventionists do, is they try to fill gaps from prior years while the teachers continue teaching the grade level material. That's the only way you can do it, because otherwise, you know, all our grades would be teaching from two years ago, and it's just not possible to get kids caught up that way. So these are things we are seeing not just nationally but internationally, these trends. And you know, we um, so there are two things that happen. You're keeping up with the curriculum, but you're also trying to get kids caught up. So there's two different approaches happening at the same time. The classroom teachers are working on current grade level uh, standards, but then the supplemental or the, the tier two uh, work is filling gaps from previous years. And that's the only way you can do it. In terms of hours in the day, you know, the students who need the most help, they're spent by 2.30. Mm -hmm. We can't really expect them to sit for another hour or two in school because they have greater gaps in learning. Uh, students have also lost a lot of stamina over the last few years. so. We are noticing students with more focusing issues and more uh, ability to concentrate. So giving them more time is not necessarily going to give us the results that we want. So we have to really strike a very cautious balance between how much we can push 
and pull. Uh, and that's where the skills of our teachers mm -hmm. really come into play to see what kids are ready for and how much they can move them along. Yeah. And yet at the same time, be filling some of those critical gaps. We can't fill all the gaps, but what Renaissance is doing and many other uh, curriculum-based companies is they're identifying what they call focus skills or critical skills that are absolutely essential for the student to make, uh, to reach grade level expectations. So there are certain things in math that you just have to know in order to move to the next grade level. So we are utilizing our intervention time to really focus on those critical skills. Don? When you say more time, you're talking per day? Yeah. Because there are schools who have added, not in Vermont, but they've added 20 days to their school year, students, yeah. that has to make a difference. I, the, the problem is going to be where do we get those teachers from? Oh, I, I know there are problems with it, absolutely. Yeah. I'll be the first to say they're not. Yeah. But there are places that have, have yeah. probably have more money, I don't know, but have programs where the students get more days. And, and we do some of that, right, with our right. summer school? Yes, yes. we have uh, four weeks of summer school, right. and then as I mentioned, uh, MVU ran vacation camps during winter right. as well as spring break. So um, we were lucky enough to recruit enough teachers to be able to run those programs. But Joyce can tell you it's not easy. You know, oh, yeah. teachers are burnt out too and they need rest over the summer. So that's where I'm talking about balancing mm -hmm. the students' needs, the teachers' needs, the school's mm -hmm. needs, everybody's needs, so that we can do the best we can. but. We've got to really be cognizant of what everybody needs, you know. And we did have like, most kids this summer that we ever tutored. We were lucky enough to have five or six of our teachers tutoring this summer. But it, you're just not going to make all of that up in that amount of time. Did they make growth? Absolutely. Are they proficient? They now? will grow at a faster rate. Right. I don't belabor this, but uh, I like your comment about teachers and burnout. Uh, and we had to get because I, I'm familiar with the school where in the summer they offered it to teachers but didn't really push any pressure on and they went and hired a bunch of recent college graduates who didn't have maybe the same skills but the data showed good gains because they had one or two teachers who were on site. So you didn't need 10 teachers. They had, one or two, they had two teachers and a bunch of recent college graduates in education. So sometimes you have to get more creative. Because I, I would not, if, as an administrator, I'd go back and say to a teacher after 200 days, do you want to work 20 more? Because I would expect they'd say no. Well, we did have people say yes, because they're committed yeah. and, and invested yeah, they in have those to have kids' a wife learning. And a family. So, but, so you go outside right, and look right. at other options. Right, but, but we were lucky enough to, to have several this summer here. That pretty much is our, our model. We have. Um, so, uh, some teachers that will do the tutoring and run it and manage it, and yeah. then we have support staff that yeah. work under them. Yeah. So it's pretty. And we're trying a lot of things that we've never lived. We have intervention in kindergarten this year. We've never had an intervention module in kindergarten before. We're having separate intervention periods for grades five and six. We've always combined that. You know, every school is doing, you'll see in people's school wide plans, everybody is doing everything they can to try to make up. It was easy to been solved. There you go. That's, That's why I'm saying everybody's doing it, but it's going to take time. And David, I, I, I do have just one quick right, comment. Yep, um, in regards <coughs> to um, truancy, we have uh, the person coming in a future meeting. Yes. So one of my questions on truancy is, uh, and I don't need an answer now, but I'm, I'm always curious of when when it becomes, or if it ever becomes beyond a district issue, because there's laws in the books for truancy. Yes. So, and I tend to be a person who drops the hammer rather than a feather. So I'm just kind of curious. Um, we do, how, we uh, do do an affidavit uh, right. when all of the other attempts have failed. Yeah, because it's not the kid's fault uh, a lot of the time. And uh, I just, I, I like to drop the hammer. <laughs> Probably more than I 
Should. So I'm always curious of, of how that happens and if this district has ever done it. I'm not saying we should do it. We do. Because, we do. But we tried the other right, first. Right, right, right. You can only drop so many feathers. Uh, well, a retired state's attorney for years won't even take the cases. Right. Well, that's see, that's the other that's the other issue. It's a it's a cultural uh, issue. Um, but anyway, so I, I'm kind of looking forward to maybe learning like. And, and Joyce said, well, like, kids are sick, they're not truant. But uh, the definition of truancy is interesting because I've looked that up before because there's, uh, it, I, sickness, yes, but, but you know, um, taking a week off or things that aren't, you know, related to sickness is kind of an injury. Are they truant? Well, I think they might be. <laughs> they don't want to consider themselves truant, but. Dear, dear. So can, can so, I just add real quick? Um, so one coach, I, I really appreciate the amount of work that you're doing on this. Um, Thank you. It's a lot. And there's, these are all kind of the same issue, right? Where it's just declining overall. And it's sort of like, how do we stop it? Um, I have a slightly different perspective as a parent of young kids in the school system right now. Um, the being sick is a real thing. It's since both my kids are pre-K and kindergarten, almost every other week and you know we're not in COVID but we're still trying to all be responsible mm -hmm. so I don't know how much of that will change anytime soon um, and I think even with the older kids like it's just going to be kind of an ongoing issue um, I'm kind of of the mind where I'm like well if we're not going to necessarily be able to change that why don't we put all offers back on the table why don't we consider giving more work at home or more home? And I know we've had this discussion, but I personally wouldn't think there would be an issue with maybe not even making it gradable, as in that it would hurt students who can't and don't have that home environment. But I do think that maybe that's something with we have teachers burnt out. As you just said, there's not enough hours in the day for um, to add learning value. Um, why don't we consider just giving more material to go home and then those that you know either want to or have the ability like maybe that's a way to make up for it mm -hmm. because um, doing nothing I, I think is going to problems going to keep kind of yeah. just building on itself. Mm -hmm. Now Julie and I have talked about this that is you know the teacher's decision if she wants to give she or he wants to give homework or not okay. the problem is teachers don't have time within their contracted hours to check homework and so if kids are doing it wrong there's nobody monitoring it that becomes a problem so the issue is not so much giving the homework but when are teachers going to grade it look at it and give teach kids feedback because the important thing is kids getting feedback on what they've actually done well, and that's one of the reasons why we have shifted to a lot of the freckle that she referenced. There are other online tools where kids can be doing practice to keep Rest up kids. and it, it monitors how the students do. Yeah. So all of our schools have a lot of opportunities for students to do things like that to really expand their skills. I, I hear that, but I do, I do feel that there are enough parents who have a vested interest that even having material of like what what are you learning that is a question that is actually very difficult if you have anybody who's under sixth grade mm -hmm. right so i think anything that we could do that could just be an addition i mean it may not put the get graded but just the fact that they go home and they complete it right and i just think maybe it's something to just put on the table because like you said we are running out of options in terms of what we can do but parents can definitely reach out to teachers if they want more work for their students. Most teachers respond if if parents are specifically asking for something. And you don't necessarily mean like, but it could be like high frequency words on a word ring and things like that that parents could do with kids at home. Right. But facts and math facts and things like mm -hmm. that. And I think the other thing you're, you're talking about is you want to know about what they are teaching in the classroom. <clears throat> Right. Well, it just it's we've, we've just moved so far away from a lot of things that worked. So we, we've eliminated homework. We've eliminated 
keeping students back who aren't passing. You've eliminated even grades that are no longer acceptable. And this is not like us, this is a national trend. Like the US is 37th in terms of reading and math around the world. Like it's just going down. And it, because it's going down everywhere, everyone's more like, I can't be the one to like stop that. So I'm just, I think it should be like, continue to open discussion of, you know, maybe we do something a little different. That's not being done, you know. Maybe, you know, we don't pass a kid. I mean, if, if they can, if they get out to the real world and they they don't have these skills, it's what good is it? So. All right. So, I think we'll have we have two more CIP presentations throughout mm -hmm. the year. I think we'll have a chance to talk about all this stuff even more. Um, all right. Any other closing thoughts here? Thanks, Kosha. <clears throat> uh, next up is a Highgate walking path update. Um, so that one's from me. Um, so the town of Highgate is, like as we briefly talked about once before, um, looking to be able to connect sort of their village downtown where they're doing a lot of uh, really nice upgrades and improvements, um, connect a walking path from there to the Highgate Arena using some of the paths that are kind of around the school and potentially wanting to cross through that uh, through the school in the Highgate Elementary School property in some manner. Um, it's not a new proposal. I think the first board minutes from Highgate were in 2016 when they talked about it. Um, I've, I've read a little bit about what they're looking for. They don't yet have a detailed project for us to even really review and consider. Um, they had hoped to have some money to work on a scoping study, which they were hoping we would sign off on. Turns out the money that's available is not actually available for scoping studies. So they're kind of set back to square one at the moment. So we're just waiting. Um, you know, I did let them know that um, they asked what what my thoughts were, and I, I said we would likely, as a board, you know, be looking at um, school safety as, as priority with potentially people crossing through uh, the property and then um, any impact on the number of parking spaces there. So um, hopefully as they move forward, they'll consider those things in any, any kind of work they do. So that's really all we have for now. Um, if it moves forward, I'm sure it'll come back to us at some point. So it's just kind of where we... Have they ever considered going up the prior street uh, in front of the old white school? Or maybe the back of that street, like at the back of the old school? It does. In there? It goes behind the school. The between, white school? The white school? It goes behind, on the other side of the playground, and then the St. Armand Road, yeah. the house is there. It's on the other side. Uh, between the school and the St. Armand Road properties, the walking path does go there, but they I've think it's them. too long. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. I've walked it many times because I've had to wait for the kids, and you and you it just works. there is a walking path. There is a walking connects, path there, and it con connects right to the um, mm -hmm. uh, the rail trail, and then you, there's the arena. So, oh. I mean, if you it, walking, there's the connection you know, without interfering with anything. <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, we'll let them solve it uh, for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, part of what they want to do is move that, move their library. And I think they'd like to have a direct walking route between the school and the library for after school programs or group programs. So I think there's a lot of benefit to it if we can overcome some yeah. of these other concerns we have. So hopefully we can see something in the future on that. Um, all right, we have the uh, Franklin safety uh, discussion. I, uh, I guess I didn't check ahead of time. Joyce, do you have anything for public session? or? Uh... I can do a little bit in public session if All you right. want to. <coughs> if, if you'd like. I will. I have a stopping point. All right. All right, am I ready to go? Yeah. I do want to get in here. Yep. Okay. Um, plug me in. <laughs> Okay, 
So I am your last presentation on safety. So I am going to go through it fairly quickly and you've probably heard it all before. So just kind of bear with me if you have, I'll maybe have some things that are specific to Franklin. I did slides just so I remember what I wanted to say because I actually did this way back when we were all gonna present in August. So I'm trying to refresh my memory. So first thing, just a couple of my own kind of important tenets, I guess, to me about safety prevention and planning. I think one of the most important things is to have an environment where kids feel listened to and feel respected, um, that there's connections between kids and adults and connections with community and parents and that everybody feels um, invested in the school and always willing to let us know if something's happening, you know, to see something, say something. I can still remember back 9-11, um, 2001, um, about quarter after nine maybe, um, I got a phone call, and at that time, you know, we didn't have TVs in Franklin, radios or anything here in Franklin, and it was a community member, had no children here in the school, um, telling me that planes had just hit um, New York, and on, you know, it was like literally like quarter after nine when he called me. And that helped us that day so much to prepare um, for what we were going to talk to the kids about here at school or if we <laughs> if we were and um, I just was so amazed that somebody in the community did that and didn't even have kids here in this school that his first thought was to call this school so I mean that's the kind of environment that and culture that we have to really have and um, obviously you can always have something happen um, but I think that's a really important piece another really important piece I think and this is hard, is the balance. I think there's always a balance between trying to have everybody feel as safe as possible and yet not feel like you're in a prison. You know, there are so many, you know, so many other things you can always do, but I want people to walk in this building and feel welcome and not feel like, you know, they're walking into a, a jail cell or something. <laughs> so those are just my kind of personal opinions and the way I've operated over all the years. So, these are resources that we use annually from the Vermont School Safety Center. Back to school safety checklist, this just tells us everything every month that we ought to be doing. Make sure we're reminding th people about in September or October. There's an emergency guide for parents that we put in our welcome back to school packets that kind of goes over for parents what all of our um, calls are, you know, what lockdown is, shelter in place, those things, what to do or not do in an emergency. Um, and when it says, you know, don't rush to school when there's an emergency, and but that's in our welcome back to school packet. Emergency response action guide with response protocols. That's something that um, is put out that has all of the commands. It's like a quick reference guide that's posted in all the classrooms. It's just supposed to be there for just a quick, re you know, quick review. Vermont school crisis guide. Um, the Vermont school crisis guide literally has all the hazards from A to Z with exactly who should do what when. And so that's a really good resource that we use. We model our emergency operation plan on that Vermont School Crisis Guide. School safety drill guidance, you know all about that, the monthly drills that we're expected to have. We keep a log. Um, those kind of evolve over the years. It used to be it was just evacuation drills, then it became evacuation and lockdown. Now it's you know, relocation options. So those kind of evolve over time. Um, there's all kinds of training videos from the School Safety Center, you know, everything from you know, de-escalation to um, oh, just all kinds of tabletop exercises, um, just like all, anything you want to, like, like oh, um, crisis communications, anything like that. And just a whole variety of other resources. And I put my glasses on. Let's see what else here. Oh, even things like uh, like um, keeping kids safe in cyberspace. These are all free resources. Um, so I like free. <laughs> so there's a lot of those. So those are all things that we use all the time. And continue that. Additional supports and resources. You've heard about this, I'm sure, um, from the other schools. The Bark software monitors and flags concerning threatening content. This time of year, we always get some of those because kids are writing stories about going hunting, and so if there's a mention of a gun or anything like that, it alerts. But you know, it's a really good thing to have, and we've gotten some um, good information. 
Oh, all kinds, um, various staff trainings that we've done. I don't know, Alice, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, evacuate, stop the bleed. We did as a whole staff, threat assessment trainings, governor safety conferences, mental health first aid, um, all kinds of trainings that we've had. So our emergency response plan is modeled on this Vermont School Crisis Guide. Um, as I said, the Vermont School Crisis Guide is every hazard you can imagine from A to Z. Um, so we kind of chose the ones that would be, I mean, I want to say more likely, but um, things that we felt were more relevant to Franklin School to have in our emergency plan. Um, re review that every year. We revise it over the summer. We review it at in-service and in additional staff meetings as needed. Um, Recently, we've added, last couple of years, a behavior threat assessment procedure that was based on Vermont School Safety Center and um, what's called Sigma Threat Management Associates. They're actually once, once putting on some of the conference tomorrow, um, I believe. And we've added a reunification plan. And of course, collaboration with first responders, um, making sure we have an incident commander protocol, um, we tour the building, share our plan with them. We have entry info, I'll talk more about that later. The state police assign a school liaison. Um, we've done a border walkthrough with border patrol of the building. Again, I can talk more about that later. Franklin Fire Department. And uh, infrastructure related, to, so that was all planning, preparation, education. Infrastructure related to building safety and security. Um, we keep all of our outside, outside doors locked at all times. Um, we added um, the PA coverage to the outside just the last couple of years because that was missing. Um, and we did have an inspection, safety and security inspection done a few years ago. And we had done, um, it was through Visbit, and we did very well on that. Um, so we had met a lot of the, um, the criteria in that already, but we have, these are things that we've worked on more recently. So we added that PA coverage. Um, just recently, we did the new fire alarm system and the enunciator installed. And the, it really was only in the last few years that we installed that access control system monitor from the office. And for many years, we did not have that at the front. I know it's a good thing, but I still find it, still find that hard. <laughs> Um, and we added cameras, we've got a clear view of the parking lot, which is an important thing. We replaced, this we did a number of years ago after a, a shooting in our state, unfortunately, um, replaced all the door lock sets to enable all doors to be locked from the inside so nobody has to step outside their classroom to lock their door. All ground level windows have blinds, interior exterior doors are all numbered, their outside doors are reflective so it can be seen from a distance. And the rest of the things I want to talk about here um, are things that should be in executive session and not in public session. And then the next steps would also be that. All right. So Thanks, Joyce. I'll Thank pause you. there. Okay. Until you go into executive session. I just have a quick comment. <laughs> yep. So um, you went over quickly the, the Franklin Fire Department and, and having them here. I think that's part of, um, you said, to make kids feel comfortable and stuff. I think that's a great, great thing that you do with the fire department because kids don't all have seen firemen right mm -hmm. close up and see all the gear they wear so they're going to see the actual firemen come in they they do stuff with them they try on their uniforms and stuff so if there is an um, actual emergency come in they're going to feel more comfortable they've seen these people they know what they're doing you're so right because when they have that mask on and that noise it makes it, it's scary and so that that's a big piece of when they come that they do with the kids. That's yeah. really important. Yeah, really much appreciate them coming and doing all that. All right, thanks, Joyce. So we'll make a finding uh, for executive session for the rest of the safety discussion. <clears throat> um, the premature public knowledge for the party at substantial disadvantage. All right, and we're on to our budget draft. Laura. I <laughs> we need some hard copies. I don't know if anyone wants one. They are yes. small, but I thought I sometimes that's helpful. Yeah, I made it. Is. And I am going to share the. Um, that's not the one I want to share. I'm going to share the um, budget workbook. Yes. 
you want to start with that or do you want to talk about the mail-in ballot discussion first then? Um, yeah, well, let's do that before we dive into the numbers. Um, so, uh, so Julie did draft a letter uh, for us to review and if the board so chooses to send to each of the town clerk offices uh, requesting uh, that we that they allow us to send out the district uh, budget uh, ballots any any district uh, items um, by mail to every registered voter without having to have request a, an absentee ballot so um, Julie did you want to make sure. comments on what I you will know? So I created the memo based um, so that we could have the discussion uh, for action. Um, so far, the feedback from town clerks has been cool uh, in terms of mailing ballots. Um, Swanton got back to us and said, would you please send a postcard out to each registered voter asking them to request an absentee ballot? That would be their preference. I don't know. They've talked about it a bit. I don't know if it was on an agenda, but they've talked about it. The Highgate, similar sentiment. Um, and Franklin, I think, also is, uh, it, it, I think that they're concerned about the amount of work that's needed. I think the challenge is that the law still says all three towns need to agree. And Well, the law doesn't reference three towns, but all towns in a, in a unified district have to agree to do it the same way. And they have to be the ones to do it. So we could support them, and we always reimburse them for costs, but it's a great deal of work. And it's, uh, the, the statute itself is challenging, really, to do this. Statute needs to be changed. That would be my opinion. How much work is it to mail the votes? Is it because you gotta put like an address on every one? Like well, think about the ones we just got from the government for this election. You know, they had uh, the ballots, but then they had special envelopes that then you sign, and then they go into another envelope that goes back to your town clerk. It's a lot of work. Is there a way we could, like, minimize it, where we do, like, part of it, just drop them off, like, something ready-ish, and they just post it? Again, we can do whatever we can to facilitate it. They have to agree to do it. We've made those offers, but... Seems like. I think I expressed at the last meeting my uh, lack of comfort with it, I guess I would say, in doing it. Uh, I checked with Swanton. I didn't talk about this, but uh, they had over 1,200 uh, early vote ballots already. So if you send this out to people, I mean, I just think it's way too much, too time consuming at this point in time to do it. I really do. Now, we're talking town meeting, so we got to do it. There you go. Uh, I, don't know. I just have this feeling that there's a chance for more negative backlash than there is positive gain. But it's my negative opinion. backlash from who? People who think it's an inappropriate use of money and an, in, an inappropriate demand of time on the town officials. They, they have to do it. I mean, most people expect their town officials to do these kind of things. So. Uh, if you've ever been in a town clerk's office, most of them are not overstaffed. I'm not saying the town clerk offices. They probably are like, well, no, but... But they're the ones that have to do it. They're the ones that have to do it. So the federal, the, the ballots we just got, Correct. That, who, who did those? Uh, a third the, party. A third party. Can right, yeah. so that that's what I'm getting at. Like... I'm sure that there's uh, services that provide the services for a fee, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm sure, but that would require us convincing town clerks to use a third party, probably. Yes, and I'm not sure whether there was some disagreement about um, right because whether we're, we're, we're allowed to do that or I think, not. Right, and I and I think that there would be all sorts of potential questions about. I mean, we're already seeing it now. 
um, in the pol current political environment about uh, questionable, in some people's view, questionable election practices. So that's another uh, kind of consideration, I think. Um, not for me, but I would think for some people who have to make the decisions at the select board level, perhaps. Um, but I, I just throw, I, I brought that up because there are third parties that probably would do all the work. Right. Well, we always take care of it. It's just a funny just process anyway because we, we, we get our own ballots printed, we get our own absentee ballots printed, we get our own, we do all that ourselves right now, and then there's this real this strange crossover at a certain point. That's is always a little bit tricky and difficult. I, <laughs> I like the postcard idea. If we really want people to go out and okay. request an early vote or go and vote. A postcard, I think, is something that gets the word out that we really want you to vote. And, uh, I mean, I love the idea of everyone getting a ballot at their home. We sent that out to the town clerks as soon as we talked about it, probably the next day. Yes. It, it was not welcomed. I think that's a safe characterization. People are, people are very anxious to get back to what they consider to be normal, was very much what I heard. So, and I, that's why we needed to discuss it here, because... Uh, it would be about this board's relationship with the select boards and, and what you want to do about that and what they're what this board wants to do in terms of do you go to select board meetings and press the issue or and say we really want to do it how can we make it happen or respect their initial response i think that's that's really the question on the table so right and so ultimately the decision is up to those three groups and yes or no, that's the answer, right? So I guess the question before us is, do we want to formally ask them? We've kind of, you know, folks have had conversations, it sounds like, um, just to gauge the sentiment out there. So based on that, do we want to make a formal request to the three, knowing that um, it really is a courtesy we're asking for, and if it's too much work and they decline, then so be it. So I would say yes. I would say we should ask. And if they say no, they say no. But if we don't ask, we already know the answer. And the other thing too is, is that um, it affects everybody. Turnout for the last vote was difficult. What was it, 90 votes, 60 votes, like 100, 200 votes, it was like almost nothing. So I think not trying to have it where we get the ballots and people have them, it, I think it makes a big difference in terms of um, the response we're gonna get for the upcoming budget, so yes that we said it to them and if they all want to decline then you know, we'll have further discussions with them. I'm wondering if they're they're concerned about the as much as the mailing out as the the back end when they get them in counting them they probably got to have so many people present to watch them open they got to check them off they got to do that anyway. yeah they go, they go through the same machine the absentee ones do anyway that night, right. they, they so I don't, I, I don't understand. No. I did yeah. offer to if we yeah. think that we would be willing to do it, you know, stuffing envelopes such addresses. I'm, I'm not I, sure. I'm most interested in hearing from Peter because he's wearing both hats. <laughs> I, I don't want to call any, anybody or anything out. But I mean, I've talked to town clerks, and and I think. They, it's going to be a lot of work, right? But they feel really responsible. Like they don't want them to come pre-stuffed and pre-done because we're responsible for what's in here. And if I haven't seen it, so, but they don't want to stuff them all either. So if they're, if, if somebody came and helped them, at least in this one case, I think they would be willing to do it. But it, like you've said, they're not like all, yeah, we want to help. We want to do this. They're, they're not excited about it. I'm f I fully support sending the letter. At least it shows our feelings, and and I think it's it's well worded that you know it increased support, and that's what we're looking for. So the the letter does say that we would do a lot of things to support them. I guess what do we have the 
the staffing and resources available to provide all that support if they all accept. We would figure it out, obviously. I'd be willing to volunteer. That's what I said to you. <laughs> I, said, no. I, I think that. it would be beneficial for us to, to volunteer. Like, you know, we're really trying to get votes back. It's so, like an envelope stuffing party. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't have a motion. Was anyone, uh, would anyone like to make a motion on the topic? I'd like to make a motion. Um, send a letter to the towns. Did I word that correctly? Uh, we know what you're getting at. So to uh, to, well, we don't have a signature on here. Who is this one from? It, <laughs> you it's, never... from the, <laughs> it's from the Mrs. Foy Valley School District Board. It's a memo. Okay, so to you can uh, initial it. All right, to <laughs> approve the memo, uh, send the memo to the three towns from from our board. All right, so Renica's first. Is there a second? I'll second. Peter's a second. Any further discussion on this? So the letter's going to the school, but to the slate boards. The three slate boards. So yes. the town clerks don't report to the slate boards, right? They're an independent elected office. Correct. So the slate boards say, well, we like it. The town clerk still has the final say. I don't know about that. I think if the select board approves it, it has to be done. Uh, just the memo isn't even addressed to the clerks. It's just addressed to the select board. Is that, as, as, it, as it sits right now, I think it probably, at a minimum, should be addressed to select board one or both. I don't look know. up the statute. Yeah, okay. Do you have it? Laura's going to look it up. We'll check the statute that says which bot, you know, because it's a body that has to approve it. But I can tell you that even if the um, town clerk does not have, cannot say no, they're still going to have a very big say in all three oh, towns. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, it says a school board may, after receiving the approval of the legislative body of each member town in the district, vote to mail its annual meeting ballot to all active registered voters in the district. In such case, the town clerk and election officials in the member towns shall be responsible for the mailing of the ballots, but all costs associated with the mailing of the ballot shall be borne by the school district. So addressing to the select boards is appropriate here. So. Mm -hmm. All right, any other discussion on this? Seeing none, all right, those in favor of approving this memo and sending it to the three town select boards, say aye. 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 Those opposed? I will oppose it. Uh, online, I heard a voice. I'm sorry, I couldn't tell. It's Steve. Steve is an aye. Terry, would you like to vote? Aye. All right, motion carries. <laughs> 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 Seven to one. And I think it's a good idea. And I just maybe hear from too many people, but I just think that we need to work with our towns. And uh, maybe it's because I'm on the board of civil authority and I work elections and I talk with a lot of people. I think in Swanton, you're going to hear people saying, why'd you do that? You know, the, the people, some people didn't like the concept when it happened during the, the COVID. So I hope it works if they say yes, but. I, I just have this feeling that there's more negatives to it than positives. That, that may be. If they say no, we'll move to the postcard. I know. I know our discussion's <laughs> done, but I, we don't have a time frame on here. You don't have what? We don't have a time frame on the memo. I'm just worried that you know we're 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 already we only got like two months, right? Right, I can add to this uh, memo that we're, you know, we'd like it to be put on an agenda next, you know, next, in next month or their next meeting. Yeah, they, yeah. they may only have a couple meetings before we need it to be done yeah. and decided. That's true. They invite us at the December one. Yeah. There's a, a community December. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. So instead of at a future select board meeting, I would put at a November or December select board meeting so that we have a time frame in there. All right, so we've got that amended. We had made a motion, so uh, motion to make a motion to accept that change that Julie noted. Frank, you're the first. You yeah, can I make the motion to make the amendment that Julie? Okay, Peter, you're the second. second. Peter's the second. All right. Any discussion on that change? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Any abstentions? Oh my god. Five votes, I think I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one thing to say, if that's okay. No yeah. one from Swanton. No one from Swanton can make the school board meeting and the select board meeting. Uh, right, we would, uh, we offer to attend one of theirs, so we will divvy up those duties as we need to. If, are they the same no, time? Did you hear what I the same time. Time. Somebody would have yeah. to miss this. Somebody meeting. would have to miss our, our meeting to do that. So I think that's kind of the cost we have here. Um, all right, uh, wanna dive into the budget workbook now, Laura? So we're doing two things today. We have, again, as we, we promised to share with you, um, a, a, you know, a, a Google slide presentation that we will keep through the entire uh, budget season so that updates and changes will all be here. It's, it's a little more readable. And then we'll also, of course, have each draft line item budget as well. So you can probably skip through Julie to slide five because I've already covered the first few. Um, so here, I, there's a direct link to draft one. Um, it, we also <coughs> had a 6.97% increase or $2.8 million expenditure increase in this draft. Primarily it is salaries and benefits that have been updated um, and a few, a few contracts that were known, but primarily salaries and benefits. 2.94, you can see, or 1.2 million is due to the salary increases. That does include what's been negotiated and what we discussed um, at the last meeting to utilize for non union and um, uh, union like support. Ask, on salaries, Lori. Yeah. Do we have the salaries just for the people under the negotiated contracts? This is for everyone based on the discussion that we had in yeah. the executive session as well. Yeah. Um, and then health and dental, um, we actually have. I'll, I'll get into that later, but it's, um, you guys can see about $520,000 or another 1.2%, and then all the other associated taxes and benefits that increase when you increase salaries, of course, um, contributes to another 0.63 or 271%. Um, that is not the full increase, obviously. We'll get into that in the next slide. So here you can, um, I just, oh, just Sorry. dig a little deeper into what, what makes up those numbers. So the union professional staff, uh, that's all will be negotiated for next year, obviously. The base salary on the um, for teachers will be going up to 46750 Teachers that are in step one through 10 are um, insured a minimum of $3,000. Some of them are getting significantly more than that, again. Um, and then step 11 through 23, they're just getting a $2,400 increase to the base and offset is at $1,200. Um, then we move on to union and non-union staff. Um, that's these numbers we discussed um, at our last meeting at, to use in this draft. Benefit increases, I'm using 12%. I didn't have time to update it to 12.9, but Visbit did just a couple of days ago file um, their request for their health insurance increase to be at 12.9%. So we're just slightly under that. Um, I definitely could have been worse. I heard a lot of discussions up to 15. So, um, and next year will probably be the same, I'm being told. Dental 2%, although it's been flat the last couple, next couple of years, so I'm hoping maybe the two of those will um, even themselves out. We had uh, to add in the long-term disability in life that we negotiated for professionals last year that we didn't get to put into the budget because we were in negotiations. So those are having a hit or an impact on um, this bottom line as well this year. And then, um, we are uh, accounting for potential um, increases for um, support staff as we head into negotiations. Those are obviously to be determined, but I'm trying to give myself a little bit more room rather than having to, to backtrack um, in case some additional things that have been discussed end up being negotiated. 
I also wanted to point out again that the pension subsidies for health care um, for, for, um, for any new teachers that are grant funded, that's over 21% now that, we, that comes right off the top for any teachers that we fund with grants. We do fund a lot of interventionists and teachers with grants, so there's a significant amount of money, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Um, that it looks like we're spending, but really it's just supplementing their healthcare system. Um, the same thing with any new new teachers that we hire and that remain with us, um, we pay a, a, a healthcare contribution for them. And right, it started out at around eleven eleven hundred dollars per year when it started. I think it was around eleven hundred dollars a few years ago. Now that's over fourteen hundred dollars per employee, and you keep playing, paying that every single year as long as they're with us. Mm -hmm. For any new teacher that starts contributing to help to teacher retirement, so those those lines are growing and they continue to grow. And well, plus, you're probably paying for more staff. More staff, yeah, yeah, it's just it's getting all, bigger and bigger. Essentially, yeah. every school, yes. every teacher will be paying more. Yes. <coughs> so there's a there's a a tax basically on yeah. every new teacher. That was one of those dark little things that the legislature does. They never tell anybody. Because I believe initially it was just for new teachers. Well, we've since that happened many many years ago. We've got a lot of new teachers, mm -hmm. so now we're being assessed by you know that much right. more. So eventually, it'll be everybody. So just under instructional, not in taking into account special educators or uh, early childhood teachers or grant funded teachers, it's one hundred seventeen thousand dollars. You'll find those under line two three three in your budgets. So anytime you see a two three three, that's that's money that's going to these to these systems. Um, What's a Franklin bond expense? Um, so then the only other thing besides um, salaries and benefits that was updated in this draft was we do know that we have an increase to our transportation contract that's already um, um, agreed upon for next year. That's about 278000 for two contracts, excuse me. And then the debt repayment reductions, Franklin's bond is over next year. So we still will have MBU. And, and, and high gate, but we will not no longer have Franklin because it's just a small reduction there. So, can you? I don't know. How do you want to handle this? Do you, do you want to go all through this and then ask questions? I'm almost you? done. Mm -hmm. Just I'm almost done. These are just the highlights. Just um, I know you, typically there's been some interest in seeing the FTEs. The FTEs all all are sorry, I'm a little okay um are all reflected on the notes as well in red so as you go through um all the salary lines you'll see the ftes this is just a um at a glance kind of uh, synopsis of that by um by the function and then just what to expect in your next draft we will continue to um look at contract increase projections as i've told you before i would anticipate those to be higher than what we've seen in the past they continue to go up and up and up in everything from um, software applications and technology to any purchase services that we have we just keep seeing um, significant increases same thing with out of district placements other professional services for students and then of course equipment agreements that we have so leases for copiers technology purchases um, and, and um, equipment we, uh, as we know, borrowing rates are going up. So um, those will be in draft two, but they're not in this one. Done. I think last meeting I asked a question and you, you mentioned that you don't have a lot of contracts. Anyway, I, I would think your other board members would want to know. It would be interesting for us to know as a board what they are. Uh, as a new board member, you come on, and I bet if you took a Count tonight, how many board members just don't have any contracts? And that's a that's a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really think that we need to know necessarily the amount, but you know, do we have a contract on 73 copiers or do we just have 10 in the district? Do we buy a tractor? Hundreds, every... hundreds and hundreds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I think as a board, we should, we should have that information. Maybe other board members don't agree. Uh, you said, you know, we've been, I know we lease cars, I know we have breath to do this, but. Uh, on the tractor, I think you said we lease every year we buy a new one. But do we buy one or lease one, rotate in our lease? We, we typically rotate leases because of the pandemic. We've, right. we've left the lease payments in there, but we haven't been utilizing the funding for that purpose. And, and I knew that because uh, NVU did a misstep one year. It became very controversial about that. I just think it's just information because... I don't, I, I don't have any inside information, but I bet most of us couldn't guess how many contracts that a school district has. 
It, you run on contracts to a certain extent. I don't mean teacher. Certainly do. No, I mean just the the equipment mm -hmm. and uh, those kinds of things. But then we have a lot of student contracts for services for students um, that are generally, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a go, and especially if you include transportation, which is often a separate contract. So um, we try and predict those when we meet with our principals. We say, do you have any any anticipated changes? No. Um, but. Of course, the, the needs of students, as we've been talking about all evening, are increasing. And, uh, and, the, and, and the costs of more. everything increase as well. I may be wrong, but in talking with business people, not about school business, things like that, the pandemic gave a lot of companies the right to gouge on contracts. I mean, if you go back and look at contract increases, and I don't know, hours probably not, but you just think of things that, you know, uh, you get a contract, well, try, it, try to build a house. Even you just think about the, the negotiated agreement we did, and we worked really hard to give increases for our teachers, and, um, and we worked hard to give some increases to our support staff last mm -hmm. year, and this board was very generous. The inflation has mm -hmm. sort of undone some of that for us, oh, and that's, that's been a real challenge. The only other question I had, Laura, if we go back to the beginning, Our, our teachers, our professional licensed staff, if you took the total new money that we had to pay, if we kept everybody from what we are now to what we, we will be paying, what is that percentage? I think it's in there somewhere. It's in the previous slide. It's, it's not, not six teachers, That was everyone. I, the the 2.94 was everyone. Everyone. Yeah, but okay. if you broke just teachers out of it. Oh, the new money? that was negotiated was 5%. Five, yeah, five. But it wasn't five evenly applied. It was yeah. some on the base and, yeah. and some to... So how did we get 2.94 then? It's 5% money, 5% new money for that group. Mm -hmm. This is 2.9 on the total bottom line of the budget on 50 mil, 43 million. Okay, so... So the increase of... So the, it increases yeah. the budget by one point. $40 million dollar budget by 2.9. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. Not the, when I saw it, that's not the way I interpreted oh, it. That's why yes. I said. Yeah. 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 Good question. So yeah. the, t the teacher's salaries would be 6.25 increase. No. No. When we negotiated last year, it was 5% new money on what the teachers were already making, and then 5.2%. Or sorry, five percent new money right. for that on that on what they were already making. Right, and that, and that carries over from this year to next year's budget. Yes. Okay. So it was six percent last year. It's five percent going yeah. into this year. And that doesn't take into consideration anybody's moving horizontal. Correct. No, or changes in staff, which we know we have about forty right. people that shift right. from year to year. And most of those come in lower. Yes. Depending on the, depending on the position, yeah. Except special, 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 special. <laughs> it's, yeah, if you can find anybody. Okay. No, right. right. Thank you. Yeah, there's definite movement, and we're not at the the level of knowing retirements and making adjustments there. This is really a rollover with the known information and some placeholder information. So really, as you're looking through, if you're if you're looking at your hard copy, it's really the 100 and 200, sorry, um, object codes that you want to look at. Um, and then if you, all the funds, just to kind of give you like a little, yeah, no, it's <laughs> walk, a little walk through. In all, we tried to keep all the labels that we put in last year. So in each little blue box at the top, you'll see like this one, for instance, is fund 1001 and it's school-based. If you continue on, you'll see the central office fund, you'll see special ed, you'll see the early childhood program. And then towards the back, you'll also see all the grants that we have, like all the title grants and things. And you'll see the positions that are funded with those specifically because they have to go under different funds. So pay attention to those blue boxes. It kind of is the higher level organization of the budget. And then underneath that, which is all labeled in red letters, is what's called a function. That's kind of like a category. So it would be instruction or health or technology or plant. Um, and we've given you definitions. They're all written out in red of each one of those functions to try to be helpful. 
Um, but primarily in this draft, as I said, if you continue underneath the function, you look at those those hundreds. So it's all um, starts with 111, it goes to 121, 123, and it, you'll see it as it goes down. It goes anywhere between a 100 and a 600. Um, we will keep updating those, but right now the biggest thing to pay attention to is the 100s for salaries, 200s for benefits. So the top um, pieces of those is really what the changes are in this draft. And we tried to make as many notes to the right as we could in regards to FDEs um, or you know um, increases to health insurance or, or whatever. And we'll continue to add those notes as we, as we work through. So you'll see them in these drafts that you get each time and you will see that in the workbook as well. Is the is the draft in the folder? The draft is a link in the workbook. I'm trying to put everything in the workbook. That way it's a one-stop shop for you and I'll just keep carrying that from meeting to meeting if hopefully in hopes that it's easier. It's linked in tonight's agenda as well. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, it, it said access denied. So. Does it let you request access? Uh, everybody should have on my end, it looks like everyone has access. So you need access. Maybe it's just you don't like me. <laughs> Sometimes when that know. pops up, it's because your personal email and your school district email sometimes get merged. So you have to be cognizant of what email addresses. And, and then we'll double check. I'll double check. To make sure you're it shared properly. All right. Any other Questions, comments for Laura at this point in the budget process? I do have a quick question about when you would like the details. I mean, at this point, we're just looking at salaries and benefits in this draft. But last time we had that walkthrough of the full budget, um, and I know some, it didn't come up in our time frame conversation. So I'd like, you know, some input into when you would like us to do that. If we do it too early, it's not fleshed out enough. But if we do it too late, then people felt maybe it was too late. So we, my memory serves me, did that at the beginning of January last year. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What did people think of that timing? You don't get a lot of information before that, do you? I mean, some, some of the biggest don't come down until January. Yeah, that's the trouble we right. don't. Especially when we come at, you know, the yield estimates and yeah. the equalized state. pupils numbers. So we want to really be looking, you know, again, we're looking at an expenditure budget increase here. This is not what the, 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 the equalized uh, tax rate is based on. That's based on the net education status. Right, and that's why it's hard at this point to really know if, this is good or bad or how good or how, how bad because we have none of the other information that we need to yeah, for the tax rate. Um, one note, uh, Joanne just uh, asked about it over here, about uh, this this draft does not have major facilities projects in it yet, well, right? Well, like the, the, just the consistent with what we already have. But not a roof no. sec not the section roof. at MBU that we've been no, talking about. Okay, so we'll shoot for maybe the first meeting. Yeah, we'll see if we can just put it into our regular Absolutely. meeting. Absolutely. All right. Else on this? Can I make one other? I'm sorry. Yes, no, please do. I got feedback around the surveys, the paper surveys we wanted to have outside, um, and we can do that. But at the last board meeting, we seemed to have some mixed uh, enthusiasm for the paper survey because people are doing mail-in ballots. And Swanton's Board of Civil Authority did vote that we can't put it in the lobby. It would have to be outside. And the other school, uh, town, it the would have to be outside. Board of Civil Authority voted? That's what they said. Not recently. It's they don't, oh, they don't, they don't they allow it previously to stand there. Yeah. They did not year. want to have anything in the lobby anymore. Well, they did for the bowl poll. Oh, yeah. but we got that from the Swanton Town Clerk. <clears throat> It's okay. So I didn't know whether no, it's no, next no, week. No. I didn't know whether you wanted me to get the boxes and tables and rocks to hold the paper surveys down, or do you want us to just focus on getting those out electronically to as many voters as we can? Because it was mixed last meeting. 
I was in favor of it. I said, kill the idea. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> I think I suggested it because I, we did get, I say, Bill Doyle. Because the Doyle poll was yeah, always anyway, got some excellent information in the legislature, used it frequently. But I'd say forget it. Probably all those folks of party members are dead, so. <laughs> Is there anyone who uh, who would disagree with Don, who strongly wants that uh, paper survey out there? Or should we? All right, the alternative is focus on the electronic version. It seems like that's the that's the sense. I checked out all the voters, so I'll ask everyone. Is that is that going to be the same for town meeting now? Because uh, we have polls all the time. Right. At we town can. meeting. Yeah. And we can talk about that. You know, people will be coming to a place for right, town meeting right. this election. People are right. mostly mailing everything. Yeah. And uh, and I was told Franklin did both the last select board meeting that they will have a regular town meeting this year. Okay. I don't disagree with Don. I think doing that twice is no bad luck. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't Once hear that. Once a night. So I'm not going to disagree this time. I said, disagree twice with you. It's like too, much. <laughs> too much. Too much. Too much. I will work right. with select boards to see if they can email them out or give me their email list or something. That'd so be that great we if we could still somehow get that out to people we don't normally reach. Absolutely. With our electronic communications. Um, so all right. no, no paper survey. No paper survey. Okay. We'll look for ways to get us to them. And then, and then, and then the town meeting day, we're still going to think, think about. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So yeah. you want to do some. Or our own district meeting too. Our own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that. So <laughs> that we can get both. Yeah, separate yeah. discussion. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, <laughs> not going to dive into that one. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll put a big, big bucket out and take one, put your name in, and you're drawing to win a free prize. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a good idea. So future agenda items of sweepstakes, as Don has. <laughs> Um, all right, so future agenda I items. Have Warren's so, going yeah. Oh, uh, right, oh, that's, that's where right. I slipped it in there, and I can work my note here. All right. Okay, so check warrants. So um, we tabled this one from our business meeting, hoping that some finance committee members would join us for the full meeting, which they have. And so um, I need to flip back to the right agenda. Lori, you want this back? Probably right. There's no. Uh, Keep it. There's nothing confidential on that. No. So Terry, they uh, <laughs> you, you didn't want to they didn't want to approve the minutes because there were no finance committee members here. So we're glad you're here. So it's now it's we'll, easier to we'll try again. We're looking for a motion to approve the check warrants for the month of October, uh, totaling three million six hundred twenty-three thousand four hundred forty-six dollars and ninety cents. Is there a motion? I'd be happy to make it. Terry is the first. Is there a second? I can make the second. Uh, Steve's the second. <laughs> we're Alright, any discussion on the check warrants? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor of approving check warrants, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion carries 8-0. Okay, so um, future board meetings. Our next meeting is November 15th here at Franklin Central School in the library at 6.30 p.m. Uh, future agenda items. I see we didn't note that here. We'll have uh, another draft of the budget. Um, and then, oh, sorry. No, wait a minute. Yes, we will. Yes, we but will. we also want to... We also have some uh, board development right. in, coming up in the future. So, um, yeah, we'll be talking about that. Hopefully, scheduling something for the board uh, later in December, but we'll talk about that sure. in November. Sure. November. Sure. Uh, I think we're in Highgate, right? Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed what you did tonight, just you and your students. I'm just wondering with budget and everything. If you might want to take a little hiatus, but probably not, because every school wants to do something, right? Yeah, we'll look at what we have, uh, how many things we have to fit in, but yeah. I think yeah. getting, getting kids in is, is a important. priority. So. 
And we stuck to our time limit, too. <laughs> yeah. well, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> okay. Heather did a wonderful job. Okay, so. Heather's quite a lady. Yes. All right. Um, okay, so at this time, uh, looking for a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, Franklin's safety plan. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Renix first. Is there a second? I'll do it. <laughs> Peter's a second. All right. Any discussion on that? Can we keep it under an hour? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. I have done my part tonight, Don. You should okay. have, no, you should no, have no, made the no, motion, Don. No, it has nothing sit. to do with okay. you. I'm uh, going to go fast. So we'll be no. inviting in Joyce and Julie. Yep. Uh, we'll leave that as all. Um, all right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed?